everyone. This is the final day of Euro PCR 2023 with a record number of participants, 11,500 plus. We've all enjoyed it, but I'm joined here today by two of the course directors, Nieves Gonzalo and Tomá Coise, who will try to help me understand what are the highlights of the Congress. Nieves, I would like to start with you. Intercoronary physiology in specific and intercoronary guidance in general seem to be very much the highlight. What is it that are your takeaways from this Congress regarding intercoronary physiology guidance? Yeah, Dejan, thank you. So really, uh, physiology um, has changed a lot in the last years, and we have seen this uh, in the Congress, how now the use is a bit different, and especially the use of the longitudinal vessel examination. So no longer spot uh, measurements, but pullbacks. So the, we have seen this in cases, uh, also in many submissions uh, from the attendees. The other important uh, aspect that has changed a lot in physiology is functional angiography, so angiography derived uh, measurements. And we have again seen this even used uh, in daily practice in, in live cases. So the application has gone really now to clinic. And there's also some interesting data that's been shown in even in late breaking trials, no? showing even some advantages of these uh, non uh, invasive uh, indexes for certain circumstances such as uh, non uh, culpable lesions in ACS. So it's, it's really a field that is moving a lot. It looks like it's moving on one side to the non invasive and also on the other side, uh, non invasive, let's say, angio based or non wire based, and on the other side also to longitudinal vessel examination of the vessel. Okay, how about the post-PCI assessment of physiology? Is that something which you see has been talked about during the Congress? Yeah, there has been also a lot of discussion about this, and post-PCI physiology is very interesting. We have to understand that it's also a bit more complex, but I think the whole idea is that you need to plan the procedure from the beginning, so you need to do your assessment before, and it's going to be the same concept with imaging, so you plan before so you know what to expect. So that's the idea with, with physiology evaluation post. Because otherwise sometimes you can be disappointed in, if you embark in treating a vessel that has diffuse disease, etc. So angio-derived limits and possibilities, longitudinal vessel analysis to understand the disease pattern based on physiology, and then finally understanding our PCI results. Toma, mm -hmm. where is the role of imaging goal there? Yeah. Indeed, they and we've seen, I think, in this meeting for maybe the first time ever, uh, a clear trend within the interventional com community with increased use of imaging to optimize PCI, especially in complex PCI like like left main, like CTOs, in even even bifurcation or calcified lesion. Uh, interestingly, this trend has been uh, following accumulating scientific evidence which show that when you use imaging compared to angio-guided PCI, and we had recently a new New England Journal paper, uh, you improve the clinical outcome of the patient. So it's not only, you know, beautiful pictures on the slides and on the screen. It's also what, at the end, it's our common objective. It improves the clinical outcome of the patient. And we've seen that in the meeting in live cases, in case submission. I think that we observed a clear increase of the use of imaging. And also, we, we built some simulation-based session because we realized that some of the barrier beyond the coast was also a clear need for education and to make it simple. Because for years, we had sometimes the feeling that imaging was for a small club of experts, you know? <laughs> and what I really enjoyed during the live case, uh, that we had really simple take them to, to check what do we need to check before PCI to plan it and what should we check at the end of PCI for PCI optimization. And I think that's what will really help the community to adopt and increase the use of imaging for complex PCI. So to summarize, building evidence for imaging seems to be on the way more and more with randomized trials. We see it around the Congress a lot in every case, live case especially, and you, as you highlighted, that also raises the need to educate. Exactly. exactly. And I think both together, I'm sure, in the coming years will increase the use, the use of imaging. That's good. Thank you very much. So given that we are, are becoming better, hopefully, in understanding the disease with imaging and physiology, what are the new technologies around that can help us treat the patients better? A lot of people talk about drug-coated balloons. Can you give us your view? Yeah, so there's, um, I think, a renewed interest in the leaving nothing behind the strategy, let's say, and especially with DCBs. 
Um, there has also been uh, presentations uh, in the late working trials about uh, this. Uh, so we had the presentation, for example, of the reform study. So basically the idea is rest stenosis is still the main indication and there is solid evidence supporting the use there. For the novel li the disease, there is a lot of interest, but still there the evidence is uh, not so clear. So I think it's uh, a lot of more work needed in this, in this part for the novel disease. Uh, and apart from drug-coated balloons, we also have some interesting presentations uh, in the Congress of, uh, for example, the last iteration of bioresolvable magnesium scaffolds with promising results. And also this new concept of this uh, hybrid scaffold that will let uh, the, vessel, the vessel grow with some parts uh, of, the, of the scaffold, let's say, that uh, uh, resolve during time. So I think there's new concepts coming. I think the idea of really having the possibility of not in the vessel is coming back because in the end we have older patients that probably are going to need repeated interventions during their lives and um, having the possibility of in one of the interventions at least not uh, having to implant and stand and having multiple layers uh, is, is interesting. So I think this, uh, this is a, a new field th that will grow and uh, new evidence is required but, um, but it's still I think this was one of the highlights. Thank you. I would like to, to hear also from Tomah, what is your take on DCBs? There is a lot of uh, sessions dedicated to it from the practical side, but also from the evidence-based side. Yeah, we see that uh, people will have, and also we can link it with imaging, because in, in most of DCB sessions, I think one of the practical take-home was that we have probably to relearn how to do POBA as Maybe we are a little bit too young and uh, we arrive already with BMS and then DS in the field. So probably we will have to, from practical standpoint, to, to relearn how to do POBA, which is the dissection we can leave behind safely. So I think that will be also, as we said, for imaging. That will bring a new need for, for education. Otherwise, I, I agree with Nieves that so far we have good data for instant restenosis, and that's the main indication, and maybe also for small vessel. But still, we need more evidence to, to apply DCB in, in de novo lesion, I think. Yeah, going into the normal lesions, I think it's important to understand that uh, the, the DCB is a vehicle to, de to, uh, to deliver the drug. So we need to do all of our pretreatments to the vessel before we deliver the drug, because the DCB itself is not going to be mainly dilating the lesions. DCB is going to be delivering the drug, and we have to do a lot of work before, and I think seeing, uh, mentioning imaging in this respect is very important, so that we make sure that we did a good job in terms of the pretreatment. Pre yes. Another important um, yes. aspect, I think, in uh, the DCB field is this idea that not all devices are similar, so there is no class effect. So every device actually is going to have to demonstrate um, if it works or not, because we have seen already that even with the same drug, there are many aspects that uh, influences the, um, the efficacy of the device. Like so release, it's a really release kinetics, yes. Release yeah, so kinetics. really, really it's, a, it's an interesting field. There's a, a lot of interest, and I think we're going to see very uh, interesting data coming in the next years, and we hopefully have uh, a, new, a new tool to treat our patients. So it's, uh, we, are, we are really excited about it. Thank you. So you mentioned data. Toma, for you, what was the late-breaking trial this year that attracted your attention in terms of translated in results into practice? Yeah, we, as Nieves said, we had a lot of interesting uh, late-breaking trial in the coronary field thanks to the, to the submission. And I think that's really a, a key part uh, of the meeting because we want to speak about practice, but we want also to share some update on scientific evidence, which, as we said, for imaging, some very often drive our, our practice. So I, I will take the KISS trial. You know, it was bifurcation study. So they had the stent, then the pot. And if the flow in the side branch was acceptable, then the patient were randomized between side branch intervention, which can be kissing or pot side pot, or no side branch intervention. And interestingly, there was no difference between the two groups observed on the primary endpoint and also on TLF and on, on the secondary endpoint. So I would say that it's a uh, it's really important piece of information because it's really answer to a, a practical question. Yeah, I, I, I also like the study very much. And what I think is also important to mention, there were other trials about bifurcations like EBC2 
and the, uh, and, and the five-year follow-up and the yeah. EBC main three-year follow-up, also suggesting that the provisional strategy maintains its safety and efficacy over time or two stand strategy. So I think that there were many new data that we had, especially for bifurcations, and together with KISS, we can convert some of that knowledge into our er everyday practice. Exactly. Final words from you, Nieves. No, thank you uh, to all the attendees and to all the people that submitted abstracts, cases. Um, I mean, I think we had a record of submissions yeah. this year. And uh, this is uh, important because, as you know, the course is made uh, for and by the community. So um, we do like to thank you, all the, all the attendees and all the people that submitted, that came to present the case. It was, really, um, it was really nice to see the atmosphere, the energy, the enthusiasm. So we hope uh, we can continue like this. Yeah. Well, no. Your final think, words? Yeah, and you have summarized everything. I think that you build your whole meeting thanks to the submission and, and, and all we've seen. And I agree that we really felt that people really enjoy let's say, being, being together again after these difficult years that we faced during the COVID pandemic. So, uh, and I'm sure we'll have a, a bright future ahead and uh, looking forward to meeting all the community very soon. Thank you. Thank Leah. you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And stay with us for the continuous education that PCR can offer on PCR online, PCR seminars, and other forms of PCR digital education. Thank you.